So you're deployed to a combat area. The last thing you remember is driving through an intersection. All of a sudden, there's a flash, an explosion, and then darkness. You're in need of emergency medical care. But the emergency medical care, you're not going to be transported in the back of an ambulance. Your transport will look and sound like this. The next thing you know, you're waking up in a stateside hospital, having traveled thousands of miles and been in and out of the operating room several times. It's probably a pretty safe bet that some of you in the, in the audience have either been in the hospital yourself or had a loved one who was. And those hospital rooms that you were in may have looked something similar to this. This is a United States IC intensive care unit. You have your monitors, you have your IV pumps, and your suction devices all neatly organized and waiting to receive that next patient. And when that patient codes or crashes, specialties come from all over the hospital to respond. And trust me, sometimes it feels like the entire hospital responds. These are pictures of my intensive care unit, my ICU. It's probably a lot less obvious, but there's actually patients lying on stretchers there. There's monitors, there's suction devices, there's IV pumps. But the difference is my team has to personally plan for and load and unload each and every piece of equipment for each and every mission we fly. The elite specialty medical team that I belong to is called a critical care air transport, or CCAT team. We basically turn the back of an aircraft into an intensive care unit. Our team is made up of a critical care physician, a critical care nurse such as myself, and a respiratory therapist. And we can care for up to six critically injured patients at a time. And when my patient crashes or codes, it can often feel like this, because it's just my team of three to respond. As you can imagine, when you combine the fields of, of flight and medicine, there's a ton of checklists that we have to follow. And although I will follow the checklist as I need to, I don't also just blindly take that it's just the way we've always done it as an answer. I like to ask why. I'm very much like a pestering little toddler at times, asking why, why, why all the time. But I like to know why we do the cool things we do in medicine. Think about Alexander Fleming. He's the guy who's credited with the creation of penicillin. He asked if I could give somebody mold of all things to see if it would cure them of their pneumonia, their gonorrhea, or their syphilis. Or Edward Jenner, he created the vaccine, or the concept of the vaccine. He said, can I give somebody a little bit of an illness and see if it prevents them from getting that illness again later in life? Thank goodness these people ask these questions, right? So I'd been on station here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for only a few months when my supervisor suggested, and those of you guys in the audience wearing the uniform know what I mean when I say she suggested, that I attend an ARFRL-sponsored evidence-based practice workshop put on by Ohio State. This was uh, a five-day workshop, and on day one of this five-day workshop, we were encouraged to ask a clinical inquiry question. And basically, a clinical inquiry question says, go out there and get into the evidence. Look and see what the research says. And are you practicing evidence in alignment with the best evidence that's out there? Man, did this week workshop talk to my inner toddler. So I've been a nurse for a long time. I was a, a civilian ICU nurse at a busy level one trauma center in the DC area pr prior to joining the military. I've deployed to Afghanistan a couple of times. And I've also worked in military trauma centers as well. So there's quite a few experiences I could have pulled upon in order to ask my clinical inquiry question. But this, I wanted this to be something that had really been eating at my soul for a long time. Eat, I like to eat. I, that's my question. Why don't we ever feed our patients during CCAT transports? And when I'm talking about feeding our patients, I'm not talking about blending up cheeseburgers and french fries and putting in a tube that's in their nose or in their throats. I'm talking about something called enteral nutrition or tube feeding. It's a specific formula that is prescribed for a patient and delivered to get them through that period of time where they can't eat on their own during that illness or injury. I know I've personally never fed my patients during transports. When we're talking about fresh traumas or fresh injuries, usually feeding a patient becomes a very low priority for a high acuity patient. 
I also knew we didn't have an approved for flight feeding pump that are part of our allowance standards or our, or our flight kits. So I figured if nothing else, maybe I can use this as a project in order to advocate to Air Mobility Command to put an enteral feeding pump into safe to fly testing. That way if a team wanted to feed their patient, they at least had the means to do so. So what I found when I got into the literature was a ton of information about all the benefits of feeding a patient on the ground. They have uh, improved wound healing, fewer days on the ventilator, decreased overall lengths of stay in the hospital, and just overall improved morbidity and mortality. In fact, I couldn't find any incidences of appropriately delivered enteral nutrition for our patients, for those patients. So it stands to reason I should just be able to feed my patient in flight, right? It's just a flying ICU after all. Well, think about that video that I showed you. It was a dark, noisy, turbulent environment. There were vast temperature changes that are felt during missions. And something you might not be thinking about is we have to plan for weather de delays or aircraft mission failures or supply issues. These are all things you have to think about that you don't think about when you're working on the ground in an ICU. And speaking of turbulence, what about altitude or G-forces and the effects of those on the body? Those things affect healthy bodies. Can you imagine what it's going to do to a patient who has to lie on a stretcher for hours on end? It's a lot to consider. One of the biggest complications associated with enteral feeding or tube feeding is accidental aspiration or breathing into that, that formulation into the lung, and that progresses to pneumonia. Couple that, all I told you about the aircraft, and we can hand our patient off as many as 14 times in tr to get them all the way back to the United States. You're probably thinking, let's not even bother. This guy's already sick, let's not introduce another complication, right? Well, think about what 14 transfers can equal in time. It can take as many as three to five days to get our combat wounded from a downrange location. And when we're talking about our combat wounded, these muscle-bound servicemen and women, they could be consuming 6,000 calories a day, especially with MREs, right? Yum. So now I'm not gonna feed you for five days? Think about how hangry you and I get when we miss lunch. A sick or injured body gets very angry as well, trust me. So, some of you might also be thinking, I saw ER once, they fed some guy through the IV, right? There is something called, that you can feed a patient through their IV, it's called parental nutrition. And very much like enteral nutrition, it's a formulation to get these patients through this illness or injury, but these formulations are very unstable and they need to be kept temper contr temperature controlled at all times. Not good for the back of an aircraft that can get as hot as 110 degrees in the desert or as cold as 32 degrees in the Pacific Air Forces or Alaska. A bigger benefit is our gut has bacteria in it and this bacteria needs something to feed upon. And if it doesn't have something to feed upon, it leaches out into the system and can actually cause sepsis. And very much like any other part of your body, you know, if you break your arm, your arm gets a little skinnier when that cast comes off, any other, just like any other part of the body, it atrophies or shrinks when it's not used. So we have to feed the gut. That brings us back to needing to evaluate enteral nutrition in flight. And this is where my research comes in. My team of researchers and I have been looking at the true effects of enteral nutrition during CCAT transports. We've also been working with another AFRL group to see the feasibility of different methods for assessing the feeding tube placement. You have to make sure the feeding tube's in the right place before you can use it. Normally this is done under x-ray in a hospital, but we pick up from very remote and very austere locations at times where x-ray isn't, capa isn't a capability. So we have to assess for other methods for uh, uh, confirming, confirming feeding tube placement. We're also working with the British Royal Air Force. They have something called a critical care air support team, just like this, our United States CCAT is a very similar concept. Air Mobility Command has placed an enteral feeding to, uh, pump into safe to fly testing. And we're also working to update the joint publications and Air Force instructions for clinical practice guidelines. These are what direct us how we take care of our patients. So they all say the same thing. So everybody's speaking the same language, if you will. So we've already had several successes within the United States DOD system, but this has worldwide implications for how we transport our patients, not just for the United States, but other countries as well. 
Isn't it amazing? A simple five-day workshop, are we doing the best medicine we can do, can turn into somebody's life's work. Now, I've had a non-traditional path to a lot of things in life. I went back to get my nursing degree in my 30s. I joined the Air Force at the tender age of 36. I'll wait for you all to gasp, thinking that I'm not that old just yet. And I can promise you, research is something that was never, ever on my radar. There may be some of you in the audience that are thinking the same thing. I'm not interested in research. But what about innovation? Or maybe let's not label it at all. Have you just ever wanted to be the best, whatever your title may be? Do you think Alexander Fleming, the guy who created penicillin, do you think he was OK with the status quo? How many times do you think he heard no before he was able to prove his yes to somebody? Or those of you in the audience who are already in innovation, research, and technology, you know how long it can take to realize the fruits of your labor, if at all. Your ideas become your passions, or your passions become your ideas. It doesn't matter how you get there, just get there. So whether you're a novice to research like I was, or you're already well-versed, this is where I'm going to challenge you to channel that inner toddler and ask why, why, why. Don't take because I said so, or that's just the way we've always done it when you ask somebody a question. Don't be afraid to attend those trainings and don't be afraid to attend those workshops. It helps you to think outside of the box, to help you be that person who makes that change or those improvements. Because it's amazing. Thought for food could be all the difference for somebody else in their life and death. Thank you.